Hello, here we are in Bridlington again. I'm going down now onto uh, the South Beach. There have been some problems though, reported in the uh, local press and national press uh, just uh, today uh, and, in, and in the last few days uh, that dogs have been going down onto the beach all along the uh, Yorkshire coast. Here on this beach, South Beach, the North Beach, Bridlington and further north and further south uh, and very very sadly have uh, some of them have become sick uh, and some have died and it's not known why so I thought I'd, I'd walk down and have a look at the beach walking down this uh, very slippery uh, slipway there's the south beach you just notice those wind turbines very slowly uh, turning. I'll just mention the uh, the wind turbines in generation because I'm recording uh, this the day after uh, this trip and I uh, we drove back across the York Plain towards Leeds. All the wind turbines were stationary. The wind turbines here at Bridlington very slowly turning, a little bit later on in the morning everything stopped. No wind generation at all in the whole north of England. So I had a, a look at the uh, statistics and um, on this particular day in Bridlington there was just, uh, in the north, there was just 6% uh, renewable energy. Oh sorry, that's across the whole of the UK uh, with most of that being uh, hydroelectric. So I'm assuming that must be places such as in Scotland or where there's an estuary or something. But most of it was gas production and we were actually on this day we were importing electricity from uh, several different countries and paying for it of course those countries uh, obviously making a profit selling electricity to us and uh, in no way is this a political statement um, but the uh, energy prices are have increased uh, rapidly over the last few weeks and uh, in uh, a few months it's expected that the electricity price will, will double. You have to just wonder what that's all about, don't you really? Um, you know, we're closing nuclear down. The coal power stations have uh, more or less closed. And, and again, coming back from Bridlinda, there was just Drax power station, one of the uh, last enormous uh, power stations just outside Selby. Selby, uh, of course, is uh, where the, uh, there's an enormous coal field uh, under the ground there and uh, much of the north of England is actually built on coal, you know, the, under the ground there are still vast sheets of uh, thick coal uh, deposits which we're no longer extracting. Initially it was because, uh, because of uh, the uh, cost and we imported coal from abroad but then later on the, um, the green agenda came along and um, who would want to return to the uh, 1950s when we were all breathing in uh, coal fumes from chimneys and so on anyway. But nevertheless, it just made me wonder, you know, where the power's going to come from because we uh, we came across one of these uh, new electric cars, one of the top of the range ones uh, coming in. And a very poor um, brake lights and uh, the indicator was almost like a you know, a, a Christmas tree uh, orange bulb fl flickering on and off, you know, so, so restricting the power to that so it would have more range. Made me wonder what the battery life on the car would be and what the future would hold. So here we are, you, you'll see some coal on the beach here. And the black, some of the black deposits that you see there, a line of uh, black, uh, black deposits along there, like a black sand. And that's actually coal now. Uh, I always thought there was a coal seam there, lots of coal. I always thought there was a coal seam under there, but then uh, I found out that there'd been an enormous shipping disaster here um, in Bridlington with great loss of life in the days of sailing ships and um, coal at the time was uh, shipped out along the coastline, uh, probably from north up near Newcastle and along the coast uh, down to, to supply London and uh, the ships actually got trapped in this uh, very pleasant uh, bay. Now, Bridlington Bay is very, uh, very protective um, if the winds are blowing in the right direction, but in this instance, the wind was blowing onto shore. 
and uh, there was great loss of life. The ships were pounded to pieces, and of course, all the coal ended up in the bottom of the bay. And I think uh, these coal deposits are uh, uh, coming ashore, which they have been ever since. And I think it's uh, it's the coal from uh, from that disaster. You see great piles of seaweed there on the left. I can't see anything here that would uh, cause deaths to dogs, but what do I know, you know? There's your dog, dog footprints there. There have been lots of dogs on here. Now the tide's right out. All of these footprints can't have been here from this morning, so maybe it was a very low tide. Uh, because I'm standing here at about half past ten. Look at this gentleman with uh, with his metal detector. Don't you think there's something absolutely quint uh, quintessentially British? I can't say it. Quintessentially British. You know about having a hobby. That chap's got his uh, metal detector looking for things, maybe rings, coins, who knows. I'm here with a with a phone, you know, as a, as a camera, and there's a, there are chaps on the pier there. It's minus two centigrade, by the way, here. Everybody's got a little hobby. Well, I say everybody, but not many people, I suppose, really, or the, the area will be packed, wouldn't it? Look at that there, look at that mound of seaweed. No, so it must have been gathered up like that by uh, my contractors, probably, or the council. Imagine if you were a crab walking past that. You'd think you'd have encountered Mount Everest, wouldn't you? Quintessentially British, having a hobby. Did you see that? That was a piece of kelp, and someone had made a little pattern around it. So some, some kids must have been playing on the beach, don't you think? There's Bridlington, it's a long way out, is the sea. And this is frost. It's like one of those craters on Mars or something, isn't it? And actually, that's, uh, that's frost. And this is the uh, the wide angle lens, the extra wide angle lens, the 0.5 lens on the iPhone the 13 Pro Max. Good exercise driving out to Bridlington and then walking along the beach like this. I'm sort of panting in places. And the fact that you can take a shot into the sun like that. You know, the HDR photograph, that's oh, it's superb, isn't it? I mean, in years gone by, you would uh, point your camera at the sun like that and, uh, you know, all the uh, the foreground would just be uh, blanked out. Look at that. Frost on the beach and some seaweed kelp, probably. Or maybe not. You'd be careful along this uh, beach, in fact any other beaches like this in the UK, because you can get a fog coming in, you know, you can get a sea fret coming in, as we, we call it here, in uh, Yorkshire. And that sometimes happens even on a summer day, you know, in early summer you'll uh, you'll get down here on the beach. And I think I've mentioned this before. You can uh, have a fog come in and lose all sense of direction. If you're looking at the ground like this, poking about, looking at seashells and things, not aware of uh, the environment around you, and suddenly find yourself isolated on the beach. And if you go further on there, if you go further on beyond the end of the pier there, you can find yourself about half a mile from the uh, from the shoreline and right down near the edge of the water. Now that once happened uh, to me and uh, a friend of mine, we were both aged about 10 years, and we went down to the edge of the water there and suddenly we were enveloped in uh, um, a sea fret, a mist that had come in from the sea. You could see about probably 30 feet, uh, that's all. Uh, but I'd actually been uh, taught how to get out of that situation. You know, we found the, uh, the wave line, the water line, and then walked away from it. And then you're on a patch of uh, sort of relatively soft sand, uh, but there's a, a lagoon of water that's formed behind you, and it takes a little bit of... Uh, you know, understanding of uh, the area to actually go through that lagoon of water and carry on in a straight line. It was easy from memory, and I do remember this very clearly, it was easy to uh, to walk across that little bar of sand, go into the water, you know, up to our knees, wait through it, and of course you, then you come up the other side, but then you've got, I don't know, possibly a quarter of a mile of beach to cover and you've got to go in a straight line. 
uh, and we walked on for a hundred yards or so and uh, encountered our own footsteps coming down, which was a great relief. It was quite a relief to actually get back onto the uh, shoreline. I think later on in this video, there's an example of that, but it's something to be aware of. You know, you come to Bridlington and not everything is, uh, is risk-free. It's a lot safer to stay on the dry sand, I think, you know. But who can resist a walk along the water's edge on a day like this? You notice there are not many people and uh, uh, you know not many dogs either for that matter. And this is because it was on the news last night about, uh, and I don't say it lightly, you know, calling it Dead Dog Beach, you know, I mean, everyone loves a dog. I used to have a dog, you know, you bring your dog down onto the beach, you know, take him home or her, becomes poorly, goes to the vet and then dies over the course of two or three days. It's course of two or three days. It's an absolute tragedy, really, when you think about it, isn't it? As I say, no one, uh, no one seems to know what the cause is. Um, but the, uh, the thing is, they've all been on the beach, you know, down on uh, this beach, or the beaches further north or south of here. Didn't see anything, anything uh, dead among, uh, but it must be microscopically, there must be things, uh, you know, shrimps, who knows what among this, but I didn't see dead crabs or dead jellyfish uh, or things like that uh, that you would see at, at one time years ago walking along here. There's obviously been a storm now, about a week ago, a week plus, there was a big, uh, big storm at Bridlington and the North Sea there in the bay was very rough and uh, then we were here a day or two after that and the, 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 the waves had settled down but there was a swell, you know, uh, uh, beating against the uh, harbour walls. Now today, and you'll see it later on, it's absolutely a flat calm but the result of that is uh, all this seaweed. It's quite heavy going here. I don't know whether you can hear the original soundtrack on this, uh, on this video of me walking up the beach there. started to breathe heavily going up there but then again I'm 73 now so a good going I suppose to be able to uh, freely walk I'm lucky from the point of view of having mobility seems a long way away it's not quite as far as that due to the uh, ultra wide lens the lifeboat's launched on the left and it has to be pulled down to the sea on a, a cradle, presumably. It's got a little tractor. I'll show you the lifeboat uh, house later. And looking down there, there are, there's great wind farms going. The, the coast curves round there, round past Hornsey and uh, like a crescent to the left there. You can't see it in this video. And goes right down to Sperm Point where the River Humber is, of course. They walk into the children's paddling pool uh, now, uh, there used to be a boating pool somewhere here where you sailed your boats at one time. When I was a child, it had a very slimy concrete bottom to it and you could sail. It, it, it wasn't a paddling pool, you didn't paddle in it. Allegedly, if you uh, dip your foot in, into that paddling pool, all the sand falls off your shoe to the bottom of the pool. Not that I would do that, of course, just to have clean shoes. Beautifully done, isn't it? Don't you think? It's, uh, you know, the money to regenerate Bridlington has been well spent. You know, making this look like tourists. It looks a little bit like Torquay. And there's the, uh, presumably this is some sort of uh, risk assessment, you know, for uh, uh, Bridlington Beach, don't you think? Uh, you're warning uh, people of uh, some of the dangers. Interesting thing, though, you know, I... Uh, uh, I, I never see any signs warning about uh, the dangers of uh, ultra cold water that's, uh, that's at Bridlington. The uh, sea temperature today uh, is about six or seven degrees, air temperature is minus two. You know, I sometimes think, you know, what would have happened in days gone by when there were those big uh, pleasure boats, you know, taking 150 people on board if they'd sunk suddenly, you know, off, uh, off Flamborough, how would the rescue services cope with that? 
You know, how do you rescue 150 people the minute the ship sort of plunged to the bottom suddenly? It's, it just, I know it just crosses my mind, you know, because I used to have a little boat, an inflatable, with a three horsepower British Seagull outboard, outboard, like I've said in another video, and uh, I used to go out there, you know, totally unaware of the risks of that. Uh, but, you know, plunged into the water, and uh, you can look a PDF uh, document up online if you wish, it should still be there, hopefully, and uh, um, sea survival. Uh, uh, in the North Sea, in Bridlington, something like that, search for it. And it seems that plunge into the water, you know, a certain percentage of people will be killed by the uh, the shock straight away. After 10 minutes, most people would lose the ability to move their arms and legs and would uh, would start to drown, even good swimmers, because uh, because the, you know, your limbs become paralysed with the cold. It's not a matter of hypothermia, it's the paralysis of the muscles that occurs before that. I sometimes think about that and I think about risk assessment and I think, you know, why doesn't it sort of say that in prominent positions when you've got uh, young families turning up and, uh, you know, if someone were to go out around the head or something, but um, I mean, the emergency services must surely be able to cope that with that. There's a lifeboat here. Uh, I, I think there might be a lifeboat at Flamborough, I'm not sure, and I've seen an enormous um, Coast Guard helicopter fly over. You just tend to be more aware of these things, I think, as you get older and you think a little bit more and you look into things. You know, there's a tendency, probably, here he is again, look, uh, I wonder if he's found anything. I ought to have gone and asked him, actually, because I've started to do that. I've started to approach people and talk to them and I've found people are very amenable, you know, to, uh, uh, to appear on uh, YouTube uh, video. But you tend to look into the risks more, at least I do. Take things for granted when you're a, a child, don't you? You know, you've got every, your adults uh, have everything covered for you and so on and so forth. But nowhere in Bridlington do I see, see a sign saying, uh, you know, how long you would survive if you were plunged into the water. And it can, here's the lifeboat station, you can see the lifeboat and the size of it. It must be a very well run operation, look, it looks all new. But there's a sign on the harbour, you know, um, effluent entering harbour. What about the cold water risk? It can, it can, uh, here's the lifeboat, look. It can, uh, I think there's two there, that's the big one. And the one in the foreground there that you only just saw with the mariner outboard on it is the really fast, rapid uh, one, I assume. I think it's pulled out from there and launched down a ramp there somewhere and pulled out to the sea by a tractor unit and then uh, launched. Oh, very rapid, I'm sure. Somewhere here, maybe a little bit further back, there used to be a, a boating pool where you could actually, it used to be superb, you know, you used to be able to hire a wooden uh, boat. It would probably be about three metres long, two and a half metres long, and it's a little engine, petrol engine, you know, chugging away. Uh, maybe even a two-stroke engine, I'm not sure. Uh, it used to be fantastic, you'd drive along in that with about seven or eight other ones and you'd, you'd learn the basic control of a, an engine driven boat just as a probably a six or seven year old child, certainly eight years old we were doing that sort of thing here. I can still hear the chugging of the motors, yeah, I mean if you're, if you're old enough to remember uh, that, uh, pool, that pool where there was, uh, where was the motor boats in here, you'll be able to hear the, uh, the sound of them. The sound of all the engines running together and queuing up, waiting for your turn to go on the boat. I've never been in here, far too posh and upmarket for me when I was younger, probably. See they've painted the railings here and kept the rust away mostly. It's well looked after as this part of Bridlington, isn't it? Absolutely beautiful beach. I can't think of a better beach actually. I mean yeah, okay. Oh you can see there, look at look at that uh that, like it's like an oxbow bend if it was a river, but you can be caught on a sandbar like that, you can walk out onto that, and then a sea fret can come in and you can find yourself trapped uh, whereby 
you're in a fog around you and wh whichever way you walk there's water and the depth is uh, increasing as the tide comes in you've got to really think about it and learn about it not from me don't take any advice from me but from uh, some of the locals here in Bridlington and we'll have a better idea but imagine the sea threat comes in there now a fog and you can't see which way land is and the water level is rising all around you there is a way to actually find your way back back to the uh, back to the side there and that's what I did as a, uh, as a child only further on, much further on, near Freysthorpe Beach. Oh, this has changed here. Surprising how much it changes. Every visit is different in Bridlington. You might think it's boring coming to Bridlington, but it isn't. It's the light's different in every day. Every single day, uh, the light is different. And you see how the low sun there is about probably about 10 30, 11 o'clock in the morning here. It's better in winter for photographer because look at the shadows on the beach. Look at the uh, look at the sandbanks there, and you can actually see shadows in the sand itself. Where the, uh, where the waves have uh, carved uh, ripples in the sand. But if you came in summer here, and the sun is straight overhead, it's a much flatter scene and the light is not as good. I mean, look at this. You've got the horizontal light almost out of these buildings. It looks superb, so isn't it? I always prefer it in winter. Either that or you've got to get up very early in summer, when the sun is still low. Here we are walking up one of the back streets in Bridlington. This is uh, the long route, I suppose you could call it that, uh, to get to the uh, Royal Yorkshire Yacht Club. I missed the Yorkshire part out last time in the video, sorry about that. Here you see various styles of architecture dating right back to the Victorian times, some of it I assume, and the Edwardian times. And then perhaps if you look here and there, some owners have made uh, alterations, you know, that have increased the size of the property. I always thought it would be nice to live in a place like this, you know, to live uh, to live close to the harbour at Bridlington. I mean, the downside would be that you're a long way from an airport these days, but if you're not bothered about that, if you, you, know, if you have a dog, uh, how wonderful it would be to uh, to live somewhere where there's a beach. And then again, I'm not sure whether there are restrictions on these beaches anyway during uh, during summer. I know there isn't a long way further south, Freysthorpe Beach, where there still remains uh, some of the uh, the old World War, World War II tank defences. I'll take a video of that uh, sometime in the future. You can see Budley is there. Well, I'm slightly asleep at the start of this video. Uh, I have woken up a little bit now. Moving on to a, a more, uh, possibly a more upmarket here. What's up, market? What does that mean? Well, there are some guest houses on here. That architecture looks nice. There's something about the gables in Bridlington, the gable ends of houses. There are some coming, I think, just around this uh, corner, because like I said, this is a voiceover that I'm doing the, uh, the following day. If you've seen my Leeds video, uh, well, I've just returned from Leeds. I've been out two days for hours at minus two temperatures. And I don't know what this site is, but it reminds me of uh, London many years ago when you get a bomb site and you get this, uh, you know, from World War II, from the Luftwaffe coming over dropping bombs. And you'd get that Budlier, uh, drawing, uh, I'm sure it must be something I'm sure you can't have on site here all those years ago, from all those years ago, but uh, you get both of these drawing like this. Mm. Little community there. Look at those pleached trees. I haven't seen anything like that since I was in the south of France a long time ago. No, it really does look superb, don't you think? And here, here's what I mean about the gables on some of the houses. Architecturally beautiful.
not sure what this is here. It must be a long establishment of some sort with uh, with those plates, trees outside. I wonder if it's a care home or something. That's the thing, you see, I come to Bridlington a lot. We come to Bridlington a lot, and I've come to Bridlington since I was a child. Uh, but I don't know that much about it. I started coming here when I was about, oh, really almost from before birth, you know. I certainly brought here as a baby. Playing on the beach, you know, six months old, two, two years old. We used to have a great time at Bridlington. A relative uh, had a, a bungalow here and... Uh, the consequence of that, we uh, we used to be brought here in the early 1950s. Play on the beach. It used to be wonderful, but sometimes you'd go back home and you'd be the later and uh, you'd find out it'd be a beautiful warm day. Uh, and it was actually freezing at the winter because of the sea mist coming in. Here we are, the uh, Royal Yorkshire Yacht Club. Well, it's a bit of a mouthful, let's say it correctly this time. There's the rigging, it's, no doubt there's a lot of splice in the main brace going on uh, inside there at certain times, allegedly. Windsor Crescent, actually the Royal Yacht Club there used to be a, a hotel, the name of which eludes me at the moment, but uh, aircraftsman Lawrence of Arabia stayed there uh, for a while while he was based in Bridlington and this is uh, where I'm heading now. You might think I'm heading to the toilet block over there, but actually I'm not. However, the toilet blocks in Bridlington are free. That's why it's a better place than Scarborough uh, or Whitby or anywhere in North Yorkshire for that matter. Bridlington don't charge for the toilets. It's more humane, isn't it? More sensible if you want to attract tourists. Well, look at this. This is a memorial to uh, wait for it. I never knew this, Lawrence of Arabia. Aircraftsman. Now, just by chance, Years before, I've been down to Bovington, uh, where he had a bungalow and he had that Brooks Superior motorcycle, of course. Big engine, big powerful motorcycle, very fast. I bet it wasn't good in its tyres, though. The wheels all look very narrow on those things. The tyres look very narrow compared with a modern motorbike, and I bet the grip was atrocious, and yet you had the power. And I saw uh, both his uh, cottage and the uh, place where he actually crashed and died. You see, it's just an ordinary country road. Walking in through Bridlington now, this is where we usually park in uh, the car park there on the right. Interesting things in that bygones across the road as well. They've got all sorts of things for sale in there. Vintage things, uh, models, uh, you know, model model uh, cars and toys from uh, years gone by, as well as uh, medals. Very interesting and well worth a visit. It's good to see Bridlington outside the tourist season looking so good. I mean, I took a video, you've probably seen it, it's probably my first video that I did. He usually waves to me, but doesn't know as I'm walking past him behind him there. Very nice guy. Now, uh, yeah, you, uh, it was, no, no, it's not covered in seagull uh, deposits, for example. It's clean, isn't it? It's fresh. And uh, it looks revived as Bridlington, despite what must have been a very difficult uh, season in uh, 2021 with the uh, COVID pandemic. Because that first video I did, it looked absolutely terrible. It was covered in uh, seagull deposits. You wondered, looking at that, and if you look at that original video, I didn't film it in very high definition, unfortunately, so the first one, and I was still learning. If you look at it, you would wonder how Bridlington would ever recover again. Yet here it is, right in the depth of winter, and I think it's looking absolutely fine. There's some more toilets on the left there. You can usually hear seagulls uh, sat on the roof making a lot of noise there. It must resemble a, 
a cliff or something to them. Some of this architecture will really be as beautiful as well. I'd love to see uh, houses and what's here would have been done with them. Some of the tall houses. We've got Bridlington Pier. We're heading down uh, soon towards uh, Bridlington North Pier. Uh, I was looking this up. There are successions of uh, wooden piers there. Uh, and uh, there's a sandbar uh, just outside the uh, harbour there that's got to be the dredger, the drips and gypsy race uh, dredger ship has got to keep it clear and I was sort of uh, reading that the uh, the canch, the sandbar uh, was there right in the middle ages in 15 something uh, and there was a, a write up uh, in one of the museums about how the uh, lock gates had to uh, be broken or something and the, uh, the river couldn't keep it free now of course there's no diesel engine five or six hundred years ago so to the right of here at the bottom uh, where the Gypsy Race River enters the harbour, there was a series of locks and it must have been released, the river, every so often to discharge through uh, the harbour. There's a wooden key, that key in the distance there is, it used to be wood. And in fact this, we'll go down and look at the, uh, the my favourite uh, place, the uh, underwater toilet, have a look at that. Which was active even in the 1950s. The outlet is at the bottom there, among all that seaweed, which shows up on one of my earlier videos. And there's the harbour, much cleaner these days, of course. The pier that was made in, uh, that's the uh, the crane pier that was made in about 1958-59. I don't know whether they used poor quality steel in it or what. Uh, but uh, I'm sure they did the best they could at the time. Um, with the post-World War II austerity factors in mind. This country was ruined just after World War II, having uh, funded, uh, you know, and standing alone against the uh, Nazis for a number of years before America entered the war, uh, but only after uh, being attacked by uh, Japan. See Flambra Head in the distance there. That's the old, uh, what used to be a mine with bronze on. Collecting box years ago. That's all come to an end, but it's a landmark, a famous landmark. This is a dangerous beach. You know, on the left there at the bottom, you can get caught out here. People have died on here, and someone quite recently, you know, with the tide coming in, you can very easily get trapped there. You've got to be aware of it. And certainly Flambra Head up there, Anyone ever going up there has got to be extremely careful. There's a six metre rise and fall of six metre rise and fall of tide. You can so easily get caught out at Flambra Head. It's happening all the time. And here, look, you've got to be careful you can get back off the beach. Just to the right there, you're just seeing those uh, beautiful steps, which originally, uh, I think they originated in the beautiful era you know, of Art Deco or even before that. Walking this pier now, which again, I've seen a photograph of this, and it's an enormous pier made, a tremendous wooden structure. All these piers, of course, were wood at one time. I think this pier was made in 1835, and then there was an extension put on the end. That little curved bit at the end was added onto it. There's the town. Walking towards the setting sun. Except the setting sun would be in the direction, wouldn't it? This is the actual rising sun. But it will soon be setting, that's the point. It's soon up to uh, lunchtime when it starts to go down. It's probably 11 o'clock here, so you've got one hour, and then you actually are talking about the setting sun. But it'll just creep along to the right there, you know, creep along to the south a bit, then it will start to go down again. And that's that's literally all you get. That's your rising sun and your setting sun. We won't go any higher than that at this time of year. Of course, that's why it's so cold, around about minus two on here. The only reason there isn't frost actually on the uh, surface there is because, uh, because of the salt from the sea. And here you are, there's some, some people fishing. A wonderful hobby to have, even in winter, minus two degrees. Doesn't put people off fishing in the UK. If that's your hobby, you enjoy it. Now, speaking to the gentleman at the end, I didn't get his name, unfortunately, he showed me a fish. He was telling me, though, how it was good for catching place when it was still, when the sea is still, the sea is very calm. Yeah. 
I noticed they were using nylon uh, monofilament line, whereas back in the day we'd be using a braided line uh, to fish off here. Look, you could just see the nylon monofilament, and you see that fish this gentleman's caught. It's good to do a close up. Here we are. Look, agreed to show me the uh, the fish from my from my YouTube channel. Make a nice meal at tea time, no doubt. Thank, Thank you. you. Here we are looking towards the south. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Take care. I'll see you in the future perhaps uh, in another video if I do another voiceover.